So I'm going to talk about violence and domestic violence and HIV infection and, and both ways, IPV or intimate partner violence leading to HIV infection and after the implications of it within HIV patients. Um, so just to start off, I have no conflicts of interest in, uh, in any of this. So what I'm going to talk about is, is the syndemic. And really a syndemic is where there's two diseases or two afflictions, in this case intimate partner violence and HIV, that syn synergistically make each other worse. So, um, you know, this has this been around for a long time. You may have heard about the SAVA or SAVA syndemic, which is um, violence, HIV, and substance abuse. Um, and that term has been coined back in the 1990s. And so this has been recognized for a long time. Um, but really, uh, there's huge links between the two issues, and we'll talk about that. And so first I'll talk about the links, the one way from violence to HIV, and then I'll talk about the implications, and I'll talk about a simple approach and what we've done at, and what we set up our program, at least in, in Calgary. Um, and now that's been used in a few different other clinics as well. Um, so, you know, back in, in, in 2009, I had gone into medical school really keen on research. I knew I really liked HIV. Um, I was in Calgary. I didn't, but, I, you know, I wasn't really sure about which way or how to, to take that interest in HIV and where the field was going. So at the time, you know, antiretrovirals are freely available. Um, <coughs> The, the drugs were really well tolerated by that point. There's five classes, there's few drug interactions nowadays. Um, most of the patients who were on drugs were doing really well, virally suppressed, they were non-infectious, so the viral load was, was undetectable. Um, and, and really, people were doing better and better and better, and, and the numbers were only getting better. So, you know, this is the, these are the patients in Southern Alberta, but it looks the same in Toronto, it looks the same everywhere. And uh, this is the number of patients on antiretroviral therapy. And you can see here, patients that are naive or not on therapy, very, very few. And it just got more and more and more that were on the triple regimens or, uh, uh, and less. So everybody that was in care was on treatment pretty much. Um, it's the same thing. This is from North America, from the NA Accord. People that were in care, 83% in 2008, and it's even higher now, were on antiretroviral therapy. Only 10% hadn't started yet. 5% were off of therapy. Um, <clears throat> but really, everybody was doing really well. C4 counts were getting bigger, or they're, they're getting bigger overall. These are the above 500s, the, the two, you know, 352, or sorry, 200 to 500 group. Most people were doing really well from their C4 perspectives. HIV was doing well, and the, the really profoundly immune suppressed, less than 75 here, are getting lower and lower and lower and lower, and um, really it's just people that are being diagnosed uh, or, or having trouble taking their medications, but the numbers are doing really well. Deaths from AIDS, these are the AIDS deaths. This is 1996 when the uh, triple therapy came in, in the blue. It's come down profoundly. I mean, there still are a few, but really, from, from the deaths by year from, from AIDS, everybody was doing really well. And so from a research perspective, you know, as, as a, a, someone who's interested in HIV and coming in, there's, you know, we're thinking, what are the questions that we can, that we can ask? We thought maybe we'd, we'd look into seeing how common it really was, how it was impacting the patients, uh, and go from there. Problem is that this is a, this is a Cree proverb, and you know, knowledge that is not used is abused. And so if we're going to look for it and we're going to study it, we needed to be able to do something about it. We needed to be able to be prepared for what we were going to find and the answers that, that we were there. So um, you know, it, it took a lot of back work to, to get this started and to make sure that we were, we were comfortable with, with what was happening and that, with what we, you know, we might find. So just to give some background of what domestic violence is, <coughs> or intimate partner violence, you'll see DV or IPV, those are sort of the acronyms that go back and forth. Most people think of physical abuse or sexual abuse as the most common uh, things. Those are the ones that you see in the media, people being killed like our patient or, or uh, you know, many sexual abuse cases, um, which are, are, are common and, you know, pertinent examples, uh, not just sexual assault, but exploitation and harass, sexual harassment, very common. Um, emotional and psychological abuse, we found, is, is just as important in many cases uh, as physical and sexual abuse. Um, and, you know, often they occur together. And so, you know, other things to, to, to think about and to consider 
um, you know, every patient and every person is different, and we're trying to put these into boxes, but, uh, you know, which might not always be right, and these are categories that don't, don't always fit everybody, but other things like neglect, holding of medication for patient or food, using that as a, um, a way to exploit somebody, isolating them from, which often happens, a victim from their families or friends, from their support networks, um, lots of intimidation, um, even of pets, of, of their children, of family. Uh, and then financial abuse is another one that often is forgotten about or overlooked, where one person in the relationship is very controlling over the financial resources and puts the other person in a very um, vulnerable situation. So the screening program, we, we started in May 2009, um, after, the, uh, after the horrible event where the patient was killed. Um, as of August 2014, and the numbers are a little bit even bigger now, we screened almost 2,000 patients, um, and about 35% of them had disclosed domestic violence as an adult or a child. And so more than a third of the patients um, in this HIV clinic were, were uh, afflicted by this. And so, you know, it, it's a real problem, and we realized that, and the patients were telling us that. Um, there, there have been some other studies that have looked at it in HIV patients as well. Low as 20% prevalence and, it, and as high as 50% prevalence, depending on the population that people look at. But regardless, I mean, it's, it's you know, even if it's low as 20% in some populations, it's still very high and a huge problem in H, for HIV patients. Um, so I'll give a bit of a background to give you some context about our program, and then I'll go um, back into the issues. What we did is we developed a screening question, and it, it looks long here, but it really takes a short amount of time. Um, at the time, the uh, emergency departments uh, in the Calgary Health region had started screening for domestic violence, and they were one of the first ones in the country actually to start that, and now there's others. But, but we, we talked with them and got some insights from them about how to approach it. And we developed a screening question that basically outlined what abuse was, told them that it's okay, that, uh, you know, that we, we made it very normal. We put up posters in the clinic saying that we we're going to ask all patients um, about abuse to, to normalize and make people feel like they weren't being um, um, picked to be asked. Uh, and, um, and then we, we asked very directly and specifically about whether or not them or their children were experiencing abuse. And then two things can happen. If they said no, they continue on regular HIV care, uh, you know, and it took 30 seconds and, and um, they focus on the other issues at hand. They said yes. Um, we had a sort of a semi-structured to a conversation that the nurses, usually it was the nurses that, you know, would do the vital signs and then ask about this at the intake. Um, so we had some structure to a conversation, but really we just encouraged the nurses to be empathetic and to have a conversation with the person, right? Because it's hard to have a structured conversation with someone. But uh, um, we did get the nurses to, to identify when the abuse, abuse occurred, if it was frequent or if it was recent, not recent, if it was within their current relationship or someone they were still involved with. Um, and we looked at childhood abuse as well, and then the types of abuse. And then from there, we also looked at, you know, we did a, a short risk assessment, um, just about whether or not they feel safe in their current situation. If they didn't, then that was a, you know, a red flag and, and we needed to get them help right away. Um, after that, everybody uh, was offered um, consultation, usually with a professional social worker, um, but depending on the situation, depending on what they wanted, sometimes psychiatry or other direct resources, but usually through a social worker. So, you know, looking back at the numbers, some of the high-risk groups that we looked at, um, and these are all the prevalences here. So, you know, lifetime for our whole patient population was 35%. As an adult, 23%. Women were particularly high risk, and so HIV, uh, or sorry, women living with HIV, 40% had experienced, so far, you know, two in uh, five had experienced IPV as an adult, uh, 46 as a um, child. Aboriginal Canadians, and there's a big Aboriginal population in Calgary, um, huge, huge numbers, 46% um, as an adult, a lot of childhood abuse as well, um, there's a lot of um, left over from the residential school system um, and some patients that, that had experienced abuse in that situation, but even outside of the residential school system and, and the legacy that that left on, on a lot of the Aboriginal patients, um, it's, it's horrifying to, to hear about. 
Aboriginal women, 81%. So, you know, it's huge, huge, huge numbers here. Um, and then, you know, the gay and bisexual men, or the, the, the MSM population. Um, you know, when we first started this, uh, I don't think we expected it to be quite as high among the, the gay and bisexual population among men. I think a lot of people, when they think of abuse, they think of, of um, you know, male to female abuse, or, you know, in same-sex relationships that it's more of a fight and, and it's not abuse, but oftentimes the people that are living there, you know, really it's an abusive relationship in some situations. It's not just a fight between two equals, right? And so we need to be very aware of the different power dynamics that play in, in any relationship, regardless of, of uh, gender or sex. Um, and then injection drug users, this is males and females, about 50-50 split, huge, um, uh, um, numbers there as well. So the types of abuse that people experienced, um, you know, you can see here that there's a lot of overlap, and and we tried to put it into boxes to give some context for for our research and what we were doing afterwards. Um, but you, you can see that most people, or this is among women, but the numbers look the same among the other populations, among men as well. Uh, almost three different types of abuse was the average that people experienced. Of, of the categories that we use. Um, and, and there is a lot of overlap between, between psychological, physical, and sexual abuse, which you know, isn't unexpected. So you know, why is it so common in HIV? And the question is whether or not HIV infection itself leads to abuse or abuse leads to HIV infection. The answer is that it probably works both ways. Um, definitely, we know that, that people who are victims of intimate partner violence have a higher risk of HIV infection. There's been three prospective studies, meaning that they measured, or they, they asked women in these cases, uh, and the last one they asked some men as well, but women, for the most part, in Sub-Saharan Africa about whether or not they were experiencing violence. These were all in HIV negative women, and then followed them for two, three, four, five years, and they found that the, the increased risk uh, in those populations of HIV, it was you know 51% increased risk, 55% increased risk, and um, in these populations, looking at uh, the attributable risk from, from of HIV from intimate partner violence, meaning that if nobody had experienced intimate partner violence, um, how much or sorry, how much of the, the 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 risk of HIV was from violence? And it was 12% in one, 22% in the other. The second one was because the, the, there was a lot more violence in that population than the first one. Um, so, so the message is that you know, somewhere between 12 and 20% of, of HIV infections probably could be avoided um, if nobody had experienced abuse. Obviously, that's a perfect scenario, but it gives you some, some grasp of the, the, the absolute numbers. There haven't been any prospective studies in, in Western countries, and it's tough because the, the you know, generally the, the risk of HIV now is, is, is low and so you need huge, huge numbers. But we know that the, the um, prevalence of, of violence among HIV patients is really high. Um, and we also know looking, you know, and, and from qualitative studies, talking to patients who have recently seroconverted, um, that oftentimes um, violence, uh, you know, after disclosing to a, a partner um, increases in frequency, increases in severity. And so, you know, sometimes there is new abuse after a seroconversion, but oftentimes it's patients who were already experiencing or in abusive relationships that the abuse gets worse, that it uh, gets more severe and more frequent um, because of the HIV infection. And the HIV infection itself is often used as a, you know, it, it, it comes to play in the power dynamics and it's used as a threat. And so there's also the threat of, of being outed among some populations as well, um, which, is, which is a huge problem. And so the, the, we know that for sure the, the risk of violence increases recently after someone's hero converts, um, especially, and then um, um, continues to be higher age, uh, after hero conversion. So you know, why, why, does, why does it cause HIV infection? It's, it's complex. There's a lot of different pathways and different factors at play here. It's not, not an easy relationship, but, um, you know, in one of the reviews that we wrote, we looked at um, all the different studies of, of the pathways between HIV infection and intimate partner violence. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, there's the most obvious one is that, that people tend to think about as direct sexual assault or rape, 
um, leading to a star conversion. And um, that's really the minority of patients. I mean, definitely um, there's, there's reports of people being um, raped in one-off situations and then experiencing a star conversion. Um, but that's, that's extremely rare. Oftentimes, there's sexual assault that happens in a relationship and over and, and repeatedly um, <clears throat> or multiple times. And that's where it may be more common, um, uh, the sexual assault leading to HIV infection. You know, the, the constant put-downs and the stress that people get from violence in the relationship <clears throat> can sometimes lead to, to, to coping mechanisms that aren't healthy, things like injection drugs, drinking, um, often leads to sexual or, or, or risky sexual behaviors, or there's a link there at least. Um, um, people think that it may have a lot to do with self-confidence and with put-downs and, and, and with being put in situations where um, they may not feel like they have the power to, to say no. Um, uh, and there's, it's not just HIV that increases the risk of herpes, HSV, um, and other sexually transmitted infections also increase the risk of HIV, but they're increased uh, uh, risk among people who uh, are victims of abuse. The other part that, that I think is important to think about in terms of the links is the, the perpetrator factors. And so, um, you know, if there's someone who is very violent uh, or, or uh, risk of being violent, the, the perpetrator's partners or other partners may feel uncomfortable um, disclosing their HIV status to that person, um, which may put the, the perpetrator at risk of uh, a higher risk of being uh, HIV positive. And we know that. Uh, from some studies in, in the states that people who um, perpetrate intimate partner violence tend to have a higher risk of being HIV positive themselves. Um, there's there's a, um, a lot of co-occurrence with illicit substance abuse and perpetrating intimate partner violence. Sharing needles um, you know, is, is one direct way, but, but um, there's other pathways as well. Um, and then... Um, um, all that leads to higher risk for, for the victim of um, being infected with HIV. So, you know, why does it matter to healthcare workers? This is besides, besides obviously it matters because, you know, this is a huge, has a huge impact. The violence on, on the person has a huge impact. But for an HIV clinician uh, and for someone who's, who's, who's treating HIV patients, there's a lot that more that comes to play than just the violence itself, which is if it's not compelling enough in its own right. Um, you know, at least the homelessness and insecure housing, I'm gonna talk about all these in a little bit more detail. Um, there's an association with drug use, smoking, incarceration, uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, mental health problems in HIV patients and, and non-HIV uh, populations. Um, and then HIV outcomes, we've shown that now it, it, it definitely increases the risk of, of AIDS, of uh, HIV-related hospitalizations probably increases the risk of mortality as well from HIV. So this is from, from our studies, and, and these are, our, uh, just to give you some sense, these are odds ratios. So if the odds ratio is one, then um, the risk of, of housing insecurity, for example, would be equal between patients who have experienced intimate partner violence and people who haven't. So anything above one, 4.5 is 4.5 times the risk of um, ha having insecure housing uh, among people who were victims of um, intimate partner violence, um, which is, you know, housing insecurity in its own right is a huge problem. And you can think that, you know, if someone is um, thinking about where they're going to stay or where they're, they're, they're going to, you know, stay the next month or the next week, um, if they're in a, a relationship, they may be willing to put up with put up with more because it, you know, it's important to have a, a roof over your head and for your family and for yourself. And so um, it, it opens up a lot more vulnerabilities both ways. Um, incarceration, uh, <coughs> definitely the risk is, is much higher uh, among both uh, women and, and probably among gay, gay and bisexual men as well. Um, you know, and again, what's the causal pathway? Does it work probably both ways? You know, does violence lead to uh, or does, does being victimized by violence lead to more incarceration or is the, the incarceration system itself is obviously there's a lot of problems with it in, in Canada and elsewhere and um, um, people coming out of that are, are very vulnerable to, to being put in situations like this. 
um, illicit drug use, um, injection drug use, and, and then smoking is another hot topic in HIV right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. This, this is just for, to give you some sense, you know, the homeless um, population or the people who were homeless at the time that they, they entered HIV care, um, in 10 years, about 25% of them will be dead. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, in its own right, it's a huge problem. If they're also experiencing violence and stuff, it's hard to get out of those situations sometimes. Um, smoking is a real hot topic in HIV treatment nowadays. It's saying, you know, the, the link between the increased risk of cardiovascular disease um, is probably mostly attributed to the smoking, the excess smoking that we see in HIV patients. And that's probably the biggest risk factor. This is a recent study, there's been lots of others that, you know, showed that <coughs> yeah, um, adults with HIV are twice as likely to smoke. Um, and uh, about twice as likely to, to, once they do start smoking, to not quit smoking. So, so um, you know, this has been a huge focus of, of different campaigns and trials now, and there's all these medications that are coming out to treat, you know, smoking. Um, but, you know, it makes you wonder if maybe, you know, the, the pushing of the venlafaxine and, the, and, the, and the, the medications may be the wrong approach because, um, you know, stress, mental health are obviously very important. For, uh, for smoking uptake and for quitting. Um, in, in Calgary, uh, the, the vi experiencing violence um, raised the risk of being a current smoker uh, by 150% for the gay males and 400% for women. So it was very um, important there. And then, you know, of, of people who were smoking, 17% had quit um, if they had experienced IPV compared to 31% without. So only 17% of uh, patients. And there's a big difference there, about 14% difference between um, uh, and quitting. And so, you know, maybe we're missing the point with these smoking cessation programs that, you know, in some cases, focusing on that is, is really, mis you know, it's, it's not being able to see the, the forest, the trees. And, and, you know, for some people, this, the smoking is the last of their worries and we're really focusing on the wrong things, although it's very important to health. Um, and then mental health. So, you know, as you can imagine, this is, this is where it, it, it leads to a lot of, um, it, you know, violence leads to a lot of mental health problems. So depression, anxiety disorder, in, in our studies we included PTSD within the anxiety disorders, um, suicide attempts, uh, and uh, visits with a, a HIV psychiatrist were all much more common among victims of violence. Um, this is the other sort of hot topic. Oh, yeah. Why do the women have all these things, like, way more risk than the men? Like, why do they have all these mental health issues than the gay men? But they aren't seeing the psychiatrists that need it. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good question. The, the, this is probably more of a problem with how we're capturing the data there, because this is only including the HIV psychiatrists in... Calgary, and the, the one of the psychiatrists there anyways, or the, the most prolific one, had a specific interest in the MSM population, the gay males. And so a lot of the women um, who, who had been experiencing abuse, at least after our, our intervention, um, we had to refer to outside so social workers. So, or sorry, outside psychiatrists. So, it's just not so we, HIV. it made, exactly. There's one HIV psychiatrist there who, was, who had a specific interest in the gay uh, bisexual male population. Um, and so there was actually pretty few patients who, female patients who had seen the psychiatrist then. But, um, mm -hmm. really huge odds. And, and you're right, like, they, you know, people, they need to be connected. It's not an issue of, of whether or not they, they don't have it, but they, you know, for sure. And the anxiety disorder as well, you know, six, per, or six times greater, and the depressive disorder is two and a half times greater. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar. Uh, uh, oh, that's a good. That's a good point. Actually, it's it, the, you know the the HIV population in Calgary is very similar to the population in Toronto, uh, as an urban center in terms of the demographics, um, and a lot of the women are. Are immigrants from Sub-Saharan Africa, so that may be part of it. And and there wasn't some, there isn't a psychiatrist there who specializes 
in it. I think it just has uh, more to play with the dynamics of the clinic because we, we, didn't, we just don't, in the database, we can't capture who sees a psychiatrist outside of the clinic. And so it makes it tough. Um, but it raises some questions about whether or not they're being connected or not, being, or not able to be connected to care definitely, which would be very important. And I'll talk a little bit about the, connect, the referral patterns as well later, which is, which is I think, a, a, an important part. Um, from an, from a, the HIV perspective, another hot topic nowadays is, is something called churn, where patients are coming in and out of care. If you know, you're on your medications, you're in care, you're taking your medications, you do really well with HIV, with your HIV disease. The patients who don't do well are the patients who, who aren't in care, aren't taking their medications. And so, uh, this, you know, this is from North America, but um, thir about 30, 20 to 30% of patients every year are not connected to care and people come in and out. Um, and so that's a huge focus within the cascade of HIV care to get people connected and get people um, to continue to take their medications. <coughs> So, you know, that's, that's one of the things that here we saw as well. People who had experienced domestic violence were much more likely to be uh, disconnected and interrupted from care. And it explained actually a lot of the patients who were in and out of care um, were also victims of, of violence. Um, Health-related quality of life is specifically how they feel about their HIV and their overall health. It has nothing to do with their, their overall quality of life. Um, was much worse. So people who, they, they felt like their health wasn't as good as well. Um, much, or at least in women, probably as well in the gay men, the, the more likely to have detectable viral loads and not to be suppressed. And that's even just of those who, people who were in clinic. Um, and then progression to AIDS. And so among the gay men, we saw the numbers for women were lower. And so we didn't see it quite as much. But definitely there's, there's, it seems like there's a signal that there's an increased risk of AIDS and end stage HIV as well. Um, and then, you know, a lot of hospitalizations as well. So, so in terms of um, HIV, so this is, I'll, I'll walk you through it. In terms of all hospitalizations, women were more likely, but not the gay bisexual men, to, to, to go to the hospital. Um, a lot of those hospitalizations had to do with direct trauma. Um, uh, and that, that's where the HIV unrelated hospitalizations come in. Um, less so, or we didn't at least, we weren't able to see a signal among the gay men. The HIV related hospitalizations um, <coughs> is, is really getting in for opportunistic infections and, and in stage HIV um, uh, were more common among both men and women. Uh, and especially after they engage in care. So these are, you know, a lot of the infections happen at the time of diagnosis. And then, you know, which, which really, it goes to the outreach and that's where the focus needs to be. But after they're diagnosed and, and engaged in care, HIV hospitalization should be almost all preventable if they take their medications. And so after they're engaged in care, um, um, we, the, the risk just increased even more, two and a half times and 2.5 times. For, yeah. Just medical. Oh, sorry, the, the, the all hospitalizations include psychiatric hospitalizations. The HIV-related hospitalizations aren't. When you said trauma, did you mean physical trauma or emotional trauma? Sorry, I meant physical trauma. But definitely, there's a, it seems like there's an increased risk of all hospitalizations. We didn't look in that granular, um, but definitely it's probably a contributor. So why do they do, why do patients who are, who are victims of abuse do worse? Um, you know, there, there's the direct trauma, which is, again, it's, it's minority and it's rare. You do, we do see it in some of the orthopedic patients, and we're starting to realize that more of the patients who come in with fractures need to be asked about violence in the hospital. Um, but most, the vast majority of, of the hospitalizations, the increased hospitalizations that we saw were not from the trauma. They were more had to do with either direct mental illness admissions um, <coughs> or problems with mental illness. Um, but the, the, you know, the way that, that they do poorly is that there's poor retention care. We saw that there may be a delay in some patients to getting diagnosed. Um, this is interesting because we actually saw that, that for the most part, patients were actually diagnosed earlier, especially women were diagnosed earlier who were victims of violence. And that's probably because of the contact, more contact with emergency rooms 
Um, but the, the variants are there's a lot more people who are diagnosed later as well. So either earlier or, or there's a delay. Um, less use of our, our, our antiretroviral therapy, poor adherence, you know, all these lead to, to uncontrolled replication. Um, uh, and then HIV related complications as well, and un undiagnosed and untreated comorbidities because they're not coming and they're not in care to be, to be screened for these things. Um, and all these things lead to, to poor outcomes at the end of the day for the patients. But it, it, often with a lot of these patients, it started with the violence. So, so we, you know, we know it's a huge problem in the population. 35% of people have experienced violence. We're seeing increased odds of, of hospitalizations and um, of AIDS and all these things by two or three times of mental health problems and, and everything that comes with it. But you know, the problem is, what, what, we, what can we do? And so we started a screening program, and then we looked back after, and we um, took about 150 patients who had gone through the screening process, and we sat down and we had conversations with them um, and did sort of a semi-qualitative mixed method study. Um, uh, 100 of them had disclosed intimate partner violence, and 50 or 60 of them hadn't. Uh, and we asked them about their experiences to sort of inform what to do. So the first question that comes up and is sort of the hottest, latest topic in, in intimate partner violence research in general is should healthcare providers ask everybody about abuse or should they just do case finding where they, if they suspect it, should they ask about it or should they not and avoid the question altogether? You know, there's some controversy because some people believe, and it's a very small minority of people, but that, that seem to be quite vocal, that if you're asking patients about these situations where they've, rep you know, they've repressed the trauma and they don't want to talk about the trauma, are you re-traumatizing them by bringing it up? In a situation where you know, they're coming in for their health care, they want to get their pills and get out, should you, you know, the question is, are you, are you bringing up something that's inappropriate and might re-traumatize them? So that's the question. Um, <clears throat> And, and that's sort of the one side of the, the controversy. The meta-analyses that looked at randomized trials, so there's been 11 trials, none of them in HIV patients, of almost all um, screening women. Um, a lot of obstetrics populations and uh, some emergency departments and some family health cares. Uh, we, you know, we know that the randomized trials show that it increases the identification or the, the of people who are experiencing violence, and it increases referral to psychiatrists and to social workers and professional services. There was only one study that looked at harm. It was a big study, and it didn't show any evidence that there was an increased risk of harm from re-traumatizing the patients. Um, but there was only one study. Um, there was one study that showed that it increases health-related quality of life after a year, um, and another study that didn't. Um, there was no, you know, there's three or four trials that showed that there was, um, uh, that looked at whether or not abuse was decreased after a year. And there isn't great evidence right now, the numbers are small, but there isn't great evidence that screening for abuse decreases um, uh, the risk of further abuse later on, um, which, is, which is a concern. And, but the, you know, the trials that have done it had a screening program for the most part, and they didn't necessarily have a huge referral pattern and a huge way uh, um, afterwards to deal with the abuse. And so that's, that's one of the concerns with the way that the, some of the trials were done, is that maybe they, they weren't getting people um, the help that they needed, and they didn't really have a good way to approach it afterwards. There are guidelines now that recommend screening all women, at least, um, for HIV, or sorry, for uh, intimate partner violence. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the, the, and, and then big organizations in the states, the Preventive Services Task Force and the Institute of Medicine both endorse screening all women um, for domestic violence. There isn't um, any HIV-specific recommendations one way or another on this. Um, <clears throat> so when we asked, you know, we asked the patients who had been through it whether or not screening should be part of care, most, the vast majority, 70% plus, said yes, um, um, that it should be. The, the people who said no were concerned that there wasn't the appropriate um, referral services in place, um, but, uh, or felt that, you know, I'm here for my HIV medications, I don't want to talk about, about the abuse. So there are some people who feel like, you know, maybe it shouldn't be. 
Um, you know, another interesting thing that came out of it is we asked if they'd ever been questioned about IPV exposure before in the healthcare system, and the vast majority hadn't ever been asked by anybody about whether or not they were experiencing abuse. And so this may be the first opportunity for people to, to be identified. So, you know, we think that, I, you know, I definitely feel strongly that I think that it should be part of routine care and that everybody should be screened um, for intimate partner violence. I think the risk of re-traumatizing someone is overstated in a big way. Um, <clears throat> and there's no evidence that it causes harm from what we can tell. It's, it's a very theoretical thing that hasn't borne out in studies. But, you know, it really has to, it depends on the situation. And the, the quality of evidence we have to recognize isn't high right now. It's probably low. But I think the risk of screening is also very low. And so, you know, I, I truly think that, that everybody should be asked, um, asked about it. And it might be a little bit of an inconvenience for people, but, you know, we'll also find people who really need the help. And it's a lot easier than you think. You know, another barrier that we've found from talking to other healthcare workers and implementing it in, in other clinics in the States and uh, a couple other clinics in Canada is that, that you know, it, the healthcare workers, especially the HIV physicians and nurses, aren't trained and don't want to go to their way. And they feel like it's going to be a huge burden on their 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 day-to-day -day practice. You know, these clinics are all really busy to start with. Um, and so to take, you know, a minute or, or 30 seconds to ask about intimate partner violence is, seems at first like it's a, um, uh, might be a barrier to implementation. Um, it's actually a lot easier than you think. You know, it's a question and it comes out and from our experiences, you know, especially after you get comfortable with asking these questions and you know your patients, you have a trusting relationship with them, it takes less than 30 seconds most of the time. And even in the patients who do disclose abuse, the conversation usually lasts less than two to three minutes, uh, but it can be very, very valuable. In fact, it's probably a lot more valuable than asking about um, um, the medications and a lot of the, the typical questions. So, you know, we should screen, but when's the best time to screen? Um, and there's different approaches and different um, thoughts to this. Most of the screening, you know, studies that have been done have been done in the emergency department where there's an emergency physician that sees a patient for you know, sees a patient for five minutes, asks about it, has no relationship with the patient. And so there's something very unique about HIV care where really it's a long, a lifelong sort of relationship between the provider and the patients. Um, and, uh, and I think that's unique and that's really important and to recognize about HIV is that you can build these trusting relationships. And from talking to the patients who had disclosed abuse, they said that that was probably the most um, important thing to them is that they felt comfortable. They knew the nurses that were asking them. They had a relationship with them, and they trusted that that the information that they shared would be secure. They wouldn't be judged for sharing that information. Um, <clears throat> and so, most people said following a couple of clinic visits when there's a trusting relationship. Some people said, you know, do it at the beginning, and, and some people said that there was no preference. But you know, we think that probably after you build a trusting relationship, first, you know, the first time someone comes to to the HIV clinic after they've been diagnosed, there's a lot to talk about. Um, it can be very overwhelming if it comes up in conversation. Fantastic, but um, if it doesn't, that's okay too, and you're going to have more opportunities to ask about it. Um, who should ask? We asked the patients uh, whether they had a preference, whether it was the, the physician, the nurse, social worker. There was no, no preference. So uh, at least in our clinic, we had the nurses do it because that, was, that made the most sense for the flow of the clinic to do it at the beginning. Um, some preferred uh, female to ask, but for the vast majority of people, there is no preference. And as you know, what we were hearing from patients that wasn't captured in here is that, you know, if there's a trusting relationship, it doesn't matter what the gender of the, the provider is. And then what, what type of question? So this, this, is, this has been um, sort of an area of controversy as well. And some people think that you should just ask about stress in the current relationship. And, and, um, but it seems like, you know, at least in our population, the vast majority of people said, you know, if you're going to ask about it, ask about it directly. Don't be around the bush. You need to be very specific. You need to define what abuse is. It's more than just physical abuse, and that's what a lot of people feel. And so you need to you know, tell them that, um, that you're looking for physical abuse, for, for, for psychological, for emotional abuse, intimidation, financial abuse, all these things. Um, you know, I think the question 
that we, that we have here, domestic violence and the threat of violence in the home is a problem for many people uh, here at, or at, the, at the clinic in the community. It can directly affect health, so we, and we tried to normalize it at the beginning. Abuse can be a problem for relationships from all cultures and sexual orientations. It can take many forms. And then, we, you know, again, we normalize it by saying that all patient, we ask all patients about abuse. Um, tell them that it can bring up, you know, the, the, basically we're ready to handle it um, if they do say yes. Um, and then we ask about abuse. And so this is, this is the, the, the question that is the sort of cookie cutter question. But really after the nurses were getting comfortable asking this and they knew the patients, they, you know, you can t take the bits that you need from it and, and uh, ask it in your own way, in your own, in, in your own conversation, so it's nat natural. The other, you know, the other thing that I don't have, I haven't talked about, but that I just thought of, is that, you know, another really vulnerable population is the recent immigrants and, and a lot of the refugee populations. We noticed that the disclosure rates among, um, especially refugees from Sub-Saharan Africa, were very low. Um, and a lot lower than what we would expect. You know, it may have something to do with, and, and the theory is, or thinking is, and talking to one or two of them, that there's a, a fear, whether it's real or not, of um, being deported or being in a situation where, you know, if, it adds another layer of vulnerability in addition to the cultural differences. And so um, it's something to be aware of. I'm not sure that there's a perfect solution for it, but, but it is definitely something to be aware of. Um, a lot of questions. I don't, unfortunately, have uh, a lot of answers for these things. <laughs> um, you know, one of the other things that we, we came up with is, you know, how often should people ask? Should they be asked once, repeatedly? Um, what we saw is that people, almost everybody said, definitely repeat it, repeat it, don't not repeat it, um, and ask at least every year. In some situations, ask every single visit. Um, uh, and so, you know, situations change, um, and if it's a quick, you're asking it again, the same question, and it becomes part of the routine, then, then it normalizes it as well. And so, um, uh, oftentimes we'll ask every single visit nowadays, but at least every year, and if it hasn't been asked within a year and entered into the system, then the patient's chart gets flagged, uh, and there's a reminder that gets put up to ask about it. Um, so what do you do if somebody says yes? Um, in, you know, in our case, uh, of the people who said yes, this is you know, about 25% of the 100 patients who had disclosed abuse actually met with a social worker. Most said, I'm not ready, not now. Um, <clears throat> these are the patients that we, that we um, uh, just the patients that we interviewed in detail. Sorry. Um, of the people who met with a clinic social worker, referral to a community service, these are usually um, shelters for the most part that, that we were capturing. And about five um, um, were connected with one, and of those five, four people went. Um, and so I think the, the, the thinking is, and we've, we've gotten better at this as we've had more and more experience with this, but the referral process and the standards needs to be in place before you start asking for it. You really need to know what you're gonna do ahead of time. And it really depends on the situation and the context, but having connections to shelters or support groups, um, having connections to uh, psychiatrists and social workers that are ready and willing to deal with this on often a urgent or a semi-urgent basis is really, really important. Um, in our case, the social workers are available the same day, always, um, and we prioritize um, people who are disclosing abuse to meet with the social workers. And so we, we made sure that they're at least was the initial connection there. Psychiatrists can sometimes take a little bit longer, but again, there was a priority um, for these patients. Um, you know, and then the, the, yeah, the shelters and support groups, we've, we've gotten better at first. We, you know, we, we reached out and we were, we were sending them now, but now that we know some of the people in the shelters and the support groups and we know the connections in the community, things run a lot more smoothly. And um, the other thing I wanna say is that, you know, it's very much context dependent. So, you know, it's not going to be the same shelters for everybody. It's not going to be the same support groups for everybody. So you really need to know what the, for your specific population, what it is. You know, and then the other thing, the other kind of issue that came up is that it's really complex. And, 
you know, this is, we, it's interwoven with, with a lot of different mental health issues and social health issues. It can't be asked and then tried to deal with in isolation. In some cases, if they're in a threatening situation and they need to get out of the situation, then yeah, that's a priority. But oftentimes, um, you know, addressing the mental health um, sequelae of it or addressing the, so, you know, the social health issues need to be addressed as well. Um, and so it opens a big can of worms, but this is, this nowadays is what's important for HIV, for people living with HIV oftentimes. And, and so anybody who has experienced violence needs to be asked about mental health issues. And the clinicians that are asking about IPV need to know how to ask about mental health issues. They need to, um, you know, screen for social health issues, substance abuse, housing insecurity, income insecurity, and then, uh, you know, ongoing recurrent trouble with the criminal justice system. These are all questions that, that can be asked of the patient. And, um, um, you know, you're not going to be able to solve everything, but talking to the patients that have disclosed abuse, it seemed that the empathy and the caringness of the, of the nurses and the care workers was the most important thing to them. Um, you know, and that comes with trying to connect them to the services that you have, but you're not, you know, it's really frustrating sometimes because patients are in violent situations. It's hard to get out. And, and you see, you know, two or three years later, someone's still in the same situation. Uh, and, and, you know, you can feel very frustrated by it. That the, but, you know, you just can't expect to solve everything. But having a safe environment for the patients and leaving the door open in case that they're ready or they're, you know, and, and at least having a safety plan for the people who are in those situations is, I think, really really important. Um, and, and, you know, the social workers have been absolutely invaluable in terms of addressing the issues of it. And, and have, you know, at least one or two of them have, have become really quite expert in, in the area. And there's, yeah. So, so the tips that, or the, the recommendations that we came up with based on our studies is that we do think that in HIV care, specifically, um, everybody should be asked. We think that it's better if you wait until there's a relationship of trust between the care provider um, and the patient. We do think that um, any healthcare provider can ask about IPV. It doesn't matter the gender or, or, or who you are as long as somebody is asking. Um, when you do ask, make sure that the question is succinct and to the point and, and so they know you're not beating around the bush, they know what you're asking about. Um, set up the referral process ahead of time um, and have it available or have some outlets available that are, that are available the same day or urgently if needed. Um, and then, you know, of people who, who have disclosed abuse, asking about it every visit and bringing it up again, if that's the, the, the sense that you get from the patient is really important, not forgetting about it next time they come in, um, I think is, is very important as part of the, the, the empathy part. Um, and then asking about it at least annually, maybe even more frequently, seems to be important for the patients who are experiencing abuse. So thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Drungill is the, the, the medical director of, uh, in Calgary. And so um, working with him was very important and his support in developing and implementing the, the whole process and taking the time away has been absolutely instrumental. Um, and, you know, just wanted to thank really everybody at the clinic. It's been, it's been great and it's been really well accepted by, by providers and by patients. So thank you.